regarding the Houthis, um, these attacks are reckless, dangerous, and they violate international law. And so we're taking action to uh, build an international coalition to address this threat. And I would remind you that this is not just a U.S. issue. Uh, it's just, this is an international problem, and it deserves an international uh, response. Uh, and that's why uh, I'm convening a meeting tomorrow, uh, a ministerial meeting with fellow ministers in the region and beyond, uh, to uh, to address this threat. Uh, we're uh, uh, that'll be a virtual meeting, and I look forward to that discussion. And more important, I look forward to uh, working together uh, with uh, uh, members of that uh, of that uh, group uh, to address the threat in a meaningful way in the future. And we'll have more details on this soon, but. Uh, we're going to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to uh, ensure uh, freedom of navigation uh, in the area. Uh, the strait is uh, straits are pretty pretty important, as we know. As you know, a large uh, amount of commerce flows through there. International commerce flows through there uh, on a daily basis. This is my video update on this Tuesday morning, December the nineteenth. Let's talk about some news and uh, let's start things off with the big news story, which is that Lloyd Austin has officially announced Operation Prosperity Guardian, OPG, Operation Prosperity Guardian. You're down with OPG. Yeah, you know me. <laughs> oh boy, here we go again. This is the third, the third conflict that uh, we're gonna have going on, huh? Not bad for, for the Biden White House, three conflicts. Well done, Bidenopolis. The adults are back in the White House. Remember that one? The adults are back in the White House. Trump is going to start all these wars. Biden's about to, to embark on conflict number three, going after Yemen, the evil, the evil Houthis. So uh, it's a coalition of 10, 10 countries. I think I actually have the list of the countries that are going to take part in Operation OPG, a whole bunch of, uh, of military assets and warships are moving into the, into the region, into the Red Sea region, like a whole bunch of, uh, of military assets. You can see on the screen right now what we're looking at. So the countries that are going to take part in OPG, Operation Prosperity Guardian, are Canada, Norway, Bahrain, Italy, the Netherlands, Spain, and the Seychelles. I read that Australia is also going to, to jump on board. We'll see. This group... This group springs from the Combined Maritime Forces, a 39-nation partnership that collaborates to secure maritime traffic through key international shipping lanes. About one-sixth of the world's commercial shipping traffic typically passes through the Bab al-Mandeb Strait from the Red Sea into the Gulf of Aden. So Lloyd Austin said that this is an international challenge that demands collective action. He said in a statement, adding that the group would bolster regional security and prosperity. So uh, it's definitely about money, definitely about commerce, that's for sure. Also about getting weapons moving, getting the weapons flow moving as well. So there's a commercial and a military aspect to all of this. And uh, this was this was predictable. I think everyone saw this coming. And uh, I guess we're going to wait for for when when the I guess when the attacks begin. 
I don't know. I don't know what happens next. But uh, something tells me that this is not going to work out as the as the Pentagon is is planning for this to work out. I imagine the Biden White House is thinking, you know, we're getting crushed in in Ukraine. Things in uh, in Israel are not going too well, so the Biden White House is looking for what they believe to be a, an easy W. You know that Biden is just waiting for, for Operation OPG to, to do whatever it's going to do and for Biden to claim victory and then he can, he can give a big speech, a big statement from uh, the Oval Office to the American people and Biden can say that uh, America America has secured the shipping lanes in this, uh, this crucial area of the world, fighting for democracy and, and prosperity. You know, Biden's waiting to, to give that speech, but uh, I don't know. I don't think this is going to go as, as they probably think this is going to go, but we'll see. We'll see. I imagine... That's some sort of uh, some sort of attacks or something's going to, to start up in the next couple of days. So that's the big news. Operation OPG. Uh, so uh, how about Project Ukraine? Let's talk about Project Ukraine, the failure for the collective West for the Biden White House. That is Project Ukraine. And uh, Come December 30th, the final payment, something like a billion dollars in military aid from the, from the drawdown mechanism is going to be paid to the Alensky regime. But from, my, from what I understand, most of this money in this one billion, this final one billion, is just basically going to go to the MIC companies. But uh, that's it. Until January 9th, 2024, when Congress reconvenes, that's it for, uh, for the money to Project Ukraine. And uh, I think Congress will eventually get money to Project Ukraine. It probably won't be $60 billion, but but it'll be something. I'm not sure where to walk to where to walk towards so let's just walk around so uh, that's it december 30th and at least for for nine ten days alensky's not going to be able to to beg for money for nine days can you make it alensky can you go nine days without uh begging for money we'll see financial times they put out an article authored by Gideon Rackman, and uh, the title of this article, this opinion piece in the Financial Times, is Ukraine and its backers need a credible path to victory. Securing and sustaining the independence of the country should be the key war aim. So the title says that, uh, that Ukraine and its backers need a credible path to victory, but the article the article doesn't talk about, about a path, a plan, a strategy. It actually uses the word theory. The collective West, Ukraine and its backers, need a theory of victory, which is an interesting choice of words. Not a plan for victory, not a strategy for victory, but a theory for victory. Ukraine goes into the new year short of ammunition, money, and diplomatic support. Underlying these crucial shortages, there is another important deficiency. The country and its Western backers no longer have a convincing theory of victory. Unless they can come up with one, Western support for Ukraine will continue to waver. Going into 2024, the outlook is much bleaker. Ukrainian forces are already having to ration ammunition, both the EU and the U.S. are struggling to agree new packages of military aid, 
Western leaders normally pledge to support Ukraine for as long as it takes, but President Joe Biden recent, recently ominously revised that too, as long as we can. I think the Financial Times is watching my videos. <laughs> as long as we take, as long as it takes, nope, as long as we can. As long as it takes, as long as we can. And what was the, the, other, uh, the other change? As long as we, we feel like it. <laughs> that was the other script, uh, script change. As long as we feel like it, and as long as we can. Oh, and I thought that Russia's economy and Russia's military was in tatters. I thought it was in tatters, man. Financial Times, what are you telling us? I thought that Russia was running out of weapons. I thought that 87%, no, no, 90% of their military had been annihilated. Didn't Lindsey Graham tell us that 50% uh, of Russia's military has been destroyed and that this is the best investment that the U.S. has ever made? Didn't Lindsey Graham tell us that? Let's walk this way. And now all of a sudden, it's not as long as it takes, but it's as long as we can, according to the Financial Times. Let's see here. The FT goes on to say, without a credible theory of victory, the pressure on Ukraine to negotiate with Russia will mount. The Ukrainians might make a deal, even if it involved making territorial concessions, if they had any confidence that Russia would stick to it. But Ukrainian officials can point to a litany of agreements that Putin has made and then broken. They believe that any secession in the fighting would simply be used as an opportunity for Russia to rearm. Yeah, because we all remember how Russia broke the, the Minsk agreements, right? And we all remember that interview with, uh, actually it wasn't an interview, it was the prank call that Vovon and Lexis made to the Putin. And Vovon and Lexis pretended to be Poroshenko. And uh, the Putin thought he was speaking to Poroshenko. And uh, the Putin told Vovon and Lexis that uh, Russia used the, the Minsk agreements to buy time. Remember that? Yeah. It's Russia always breaking those agreements. And you know the grain deal? It was it was Russia that that didn't honor the grain deal. Yep, Russia's always breaking those agreements. <laughs> uh, projection. Projection is their favorite tool. The collective West media loves to project. Boy, do they love to project. So the article goes on to say that uh, two options. There are two possible options for Ukraine. One option is freezing the conflict, which a lot of Western officials are, are pushing the Alensky regime to do. And another option is a type of armistice. Just uh, not negotiating an end to the war, but just saying we're going to stop fighting. That's, uh, that's another option, according to, to this article, that collective West officials are are kicking around, are discussing. But always keep in mind, we're talking about theories of victory. Not a plan, not a strategy, but a theory of victory. Because it's optics that matter. It's always about optics. Can we fool the citizens of the collective West into believing that we have won? That's what matters. So the Financial Times says uh, in its last paragraphs of this article, it is certainly true that Russia has done far worse in this conflict and Ukraine far better. <laughs> I said this yesterday. I said this yesterday. Uh, before I go on, whenever they're they're talking about how things are going bad in, in Ukraine. They always have to have to say things are going much worse in Russia. That's like standard. That is like standard procedure now for the collective West media. If you're going to 
Hmm. Let's go this way. If you're going to criticize or reveal some truths about the catastrophe that is Ukraine, just make sure that you talk about how things are going much worse for Russia. Anyway, uh, let's see. It is certainly true that Russia has done far worse in this conflict and Ukraine far better than most analysts dared to hope in February 2022 when the full-scale invasion began. The Russians were humiliatingly defeated in the Battle of Kiev, the Siege of Kiev. Putin has sacrificed hundreds of thousands of lives for minor territorial gains. And Russia, for the first time in, century, in centuries, has virtually no allies on the European continent. Ukraine, by contrast, now enjoys an unprecedented level of international support and respect. The country has also paid a terrible price for this war, but its status as an independent nation with its, with its own proud culture and identity will never be erased again. In the great sweep of history, that is a victory that will really count. Got to create a theory of victory. It's all about creating a theory of victory. Russia has no friends on the European continent. On the European continent, Russia is isolated. But in 80% of the rest of the world, Russia has all the friends it needs. But on the European continent, it's isolated. Rest of the world, all the friends it needs. South America, Africa, Asia, Eurasia. But on the European continent, no friends. And we all know that it's the European continent that counts. The rest of the world doesn't count. European continent, that's what counts. Ursula, Burrell, the garden, the garden. In the garden, Russia has no friends. In the uh, jungle, Russia got a lot of friends in the jungle. Welcome to the jungle. And, uh, and what else? Let's see. Yeah, the, the siege of Kiev. Boy, did they get a lot of mileage out of the siege of Kiev. Who, who made up the siege of Kiev? I think that was Millie. I think Millie came up with the, with the fiction that is the siege of Kiev. Pretty, pretty smart move from Millie, huh? Pretty creative storytelling from, uh, from Millie. They've gotten a lot of mileage from the siege of Kiev. 40,000 Russian troops looking to take over a city of 3 million people. The siege of Kiev. Because only the Russian military is that delusional and that incompetent to believe that 40,000 people can conquer a city of 3 million. <laughs> the siege of Kiev. Uh, so there was an interview with, uh, with Ben Hodges, someone who really believes in the siege of Kiev. Ben Hodges, the one-time commander of NATO. I believe it was the commander of NATO or, or something like that. And uh, Ben Hodges, in this interview, he said that uh, Ukraine needs to start drafting women and rounding up every Ukrainian refugee who fled the country if the Germans could go, if the Germans could do it in 44, so can Ukraine. That is what, uh, the, what Ben Hodges is saying, according to this, this interview with a channel called Pre, Pre Run or something like that. I'm not, not really sure about this channel or what they're about. But uh, they have a pretty long, like, interview with, uh, interview video with, with Ben Hodges. Interesting comment from Ben Hodges. The man who has gotten every single prediction about conflict Ukraine wrong. Every, every single prediction Ben Hodges has made has turned out to be wrong. Whatever Ben Hodges says, it's the exact opposite. That's, uh... That's Ben Hodges. He found the park.
So uh, the, the European Union is uh, transitioning. Europe is transitioning. And they're starting to, to transition away from, from believing that proxy Ukraine would remove the Putin and would defeat Russia. And it looks like Europe is now going to, to have to do the job by themselves. Can't, uh, can't trust that Alensky. Can't believe that Alensky is going to, to be able to remove the Putin anymore. That belief has been shattered. And now it falls on Europe and specifically Germany to, uh, to do what Ukraine could not do, which is to defeat the Putin. That's where things are heading. And uh, Germany, they announced that they are going to be deploying a 5,000 strong brigade to, to uh, Lithuania. To Lithuania. Defense ministers from Berlin and Vilnius have signed a major military deployment plan. Germany and Lithuania on Monday signed a roadmap for what is set to become the largest deployment of German troops on foreign soil in the modern era. Under the plan, the 5,000 strong brigade will be stationed less than 20 kilometers or 12 miles from the border with Belarus, Moscow's key ally. And Newsweek, they have a title, they have an article with the title, Germany will deploy troops for first time since World War II. Yeah, we, we know how that one ended, don't we? We know how all of this ends, but every, every 70, 80 years, every 70, 80 years, the collective West has to, uh, has to make another go at Russia. I don't know. I think, uh, I think the Russians should like create like, like a clock or something that just measures every 70, 80 years. Oh, about time now that they're going to start to, to make another go at us. And, uh, and yeah, we know how it always ends, but it looks like Germany is going to, uh, to take another shot at Russia. And then, of course, you have all the U.S. military buildup in Finland. Something like 15. What is, what is the number that I read? Do you guys remember what the number was? Something like 15 military installations or something like that. Finland is just going to give the United States like a whole bunch of uh, territory to just start building up uh, bases and weapons and station troops and, and things like that. But it's the Putin that's evil. It's the Putin that is, uh, that is provoking NATO. Yep. That Putin moving his country closer to, to NATO borders. <laughs> Damn it, Putin. Why do you provoke NATO like that? The Putin's fault. So yeah, it looks like Europe... Maybe the plan is over the next few years for, uh, for Europe to, to start to prepare to, to make another go at Russia, given that Project Ukraine has, has failed, it has collapsed. And so uh, Germany, start, start preparing, start getting things in, in order to, to make another run at Russia. And, uh, and you have a German, a German CDU member of the Bundestag, Mr. Roderick Kaiswetter, who said that the situation in Ukraine, that Europe cannot lose in Ukraine because it's going to, to not be able to extract highly needed lithium. If Europe wants to achieve energy transition, then it needs its own lithium deposits. The largest lithium deposits are located in the regions of Donetsk and Lugansk, said this CDU member of the Bundestag. Gotta get that lithium. Didn't Nirvana have a song called Lithium? What did Kurt Cobain know? What did Kurt Cobain know back then? 
Yeah, so uh, it's all about those resources in Lugansk. I bet that explains uh, Annalena's obsession with, uh, with the Donbass and with uh, Project Ukraine, given that she's a high priestess of the, of the green religion. Maybe she's, uh, she's obsessed with getting some of that lithium in uh, Donetsk and Lugansk. Didn't Annalena, didn't she say a few months back that uh, Europe is going to extend from Lisbon to Lugansk? She did say that, Annalena 720i. Europe is going to extend from Lisbon to Lugansk. That sounds like a nice movie title, huh? From Lisbon to Lugansk. One one woman's journey from humble beginnings in Germany to, to an all-powerful warmonger in the European Union, <laughs> from Lisbon to Lugansk. The story of Annalena Baerbach, starring Jennifer Lawrence as Annalena Baerbach, Sean Penn as the evil Putin, uh, Justin Trudeau has Justin Trudeau, and Will Ferrell as Olaf Schultz. <laughs> From Lisbon to Lugansk, <laughs> a woman's journey <laughs> to becoming an all-powerful Globalist. <laughs> oh, boy. So, uh, <laughs> speaking about the European Union, Mr. Thierry Brenton, who's like the guy in charge of the EU's Digital Services or Security Act or whatever it's called, the DSA, he posted on Twitter X that the European Union is going to go after Twitter X. <laughs> This is what he uh, posted. Today, we open formal infringement proceedings against X, suspected breach of obligations to counter illegal content and disinformation, suspected breach of trans transparency obligations, and suspected deceptive design of user interface. Sounds really serious. Deceptive design. Yeah, Twitter is, Twitter X is deceptive in its design, isn't it, huh? You know, that home button and that messaging button and that bookmarks button. It's really deceptive. That repost button, <laughs> it's really, really deceptive in its design. Very deceptive. <laughs> Community notes, super deceptive. <laughs> oh, boy. So, you know what, uh, what Musk should do? in this instance, which I know is not going to happen. But what he should do is that uh, he should do what Rumble did with France, which is to just remove Twitter from the European Union. <laughs> That's what he should do. People who really want to use Twitter, they'll get on a VPN and they'll use Twitter. But uh, Musk should say, all right, you know, um, you don't want me to to be here on this playground, well, I'm going to take my ball and I'm going to go to, to another playground. <laughs> I'm going to leave. <laughs> That's what Musk should do. That is exactly what Musk should do, but he's not going to do it. But boy, if he, uh, if he did that, the EU would last for, for how long? One week before it folded. One week I would give them because... They are super addicted to, uh, to Twitter X. How else would they be able to put out their disinformation on what? On Facebook threads <laughs> to all five users that actually are on threads? <laughs> where? Where would they put out their, their disinformation, the European Union? Where would they put out their propaganda without Twitter X? One week, if Musk said, you know what? Twitter X is no longer accessible in the European Union. If he did that, the EU would not last. They would take this, this infringement case and they would, they would retract it. All of it. 
That's exactly what would happen. Elon Musk uh, re replied to, to the EU's Thierry Brenton, and he said, are you taking action against other social media? Because if you have those issues with this platform and none are perfect, the others are much worse. Yeah. Yeroman said, you are not only cowards, you are fascists. Yep. Authoritarians. This is what authoritarians do. Uh, Henning, Henning Rosenbusk said, surely we are allowed to see the allegations in, in detail for reasons of transparency, of course. Ben said, as an EU citizen, this is a disgrace. You are abusing your power to go after free speech. Absolutely. Ian Miles Chung said, who elected you? You don't own X and you aren't Elon's boss. Also true. Matt Bracken said, only tyrants fear free speech. Also true. <laughs> I'm just reading some of the comments underneath this guy's uh, post. Yeah. All true. Who elected these guys? I don't remember Ursula campaigning in Greece or Cyprus. People in Greece, do you remember Ursula campaigning for the, for the top job of EU, EU commissioner? Do you remember her giving speeches in like Sindagma Square? I don't. <laughs> so who elected these people? But you know, uh, I said this a long time ago when, uh, when the EU uh, banned Russian media and Russian airlines from flying into EU territory. That's the word that Ursula used, EU territory. And when I heard that, my spidey senses activated. Uh, there is no sovereignty in the European Union. EU states, with the exception of Hungary and Slovakia, there is no sovereignty. The kleptocrats in Brussels, they see Europe as EU globalist territory. And uh, when they banned RT and Russian media in Europe, and when they banned airlines from traveling, traveling into Europe, everyone went along with it. Everyone went along with it in Europe. And in the United States, no one said anything because it was Russia. You see, it was the evil Putin. So the Russians should not be allowed to travel to Europe and Russian media should not be, uh, should not be viewed in Europe. Everyone just went along with it. And when you give them an inch, well, you know the saying. And so now they're going after X and tomorrow they're going to go after someone else who they don't approve of, and eventually they're, they're going to start targeting individuals. That's how this goes. And that doesn't only include media, that includes uh, social media and internet, that's going to also include travel, believe me. So uh, yeah, what Elon Musk has to do is he has to be, has to be the hero, the hero again, perhaps. And he has to say, no problem, guys. I don't want to fight. I don't want to fight with you all. I'll just remove Twitter X from the EU. No problem. No problem, bro. <laughs> You'll see the reaction if you were to do that. Anyway, uh, Tucker Carlson, since we're speaking about free speech heroes, Tucker Carlson was speaking to, to Tim Poole and he was asked about Nikki Haley as Trump's vice president pick. There's a lot of talk now about Nikki Haley being a Trump's VP pick. And, uh, and Tucker said, you know what? If Trump were to choose Nikki Haley, I'm out. There's no way I'm going to be supporting Trump. And I agree with that. I agree with that. I think that that the chances of Trump, the chances of Trump choosing Haley as VP, I would put it at 5%. Now, some people may say 5%, that's pretty high. There's no way that Trump would choose Nikki Haley as VP. I say 5%, maybe 10%. And I say that because Trump, one of his, not one of, his, his greatest weakness, his greatest weakness is this, 
this, uh, I wanted to say soft spot, but maybe, maybe naivete towards the neocons. And the neocons always, uh, they always take advantage of that. And uh, it was Bolton, Pompeo, McMasters, Esper. You know, Trump filled his, can his uh, cabinet with neocons. And uh, the fear is that the neocons will once again, when Trump is the nominee and if everything is free and fair, will be the president, then you know that the neocons are going to, as Trump is, uh, is running for, for president and he has to choose his VP, you know the neocons are going to be whispering in Trump's ear, choose Haley, man, choose Haley. She'd be a good VP. She'll be a good VP, trust us. And, and, and Trump, when it comes to neocons, he has this, this type of, of weakness every now and then when it comes to neocons. But uh, if he were to choose Haley, neocon Nikki, I'm with Tucker, I'm out. So I think this is smart from Tucker. I think Tucker is putting the message out right now because I think he's heard these whispers and these, these mumblings about Nikki Haley as VP. And he may know some, some information that we don't know, which is that the Trump, uh, the Trump campaign is actually kicking around this idea. And I think Tucker is like, you know what? Tucker and Tim Pool, they're like, you know what? We gotta, we gotta cut this thing off right now. So they put the message out there. Nikki Haley as VP, we're done with you. So uh, I think that was a smart move. That was a smart move. And uh, by the way, the, the EU, uh, they actually... Uh, passed the 12th sanctions package as well, which is going to ban Russian diamonds. So that was approved yesterday as well. They also, they also sanctioned Dmitry Medvedev's 28-year-old son for the uh, crime of being Dmitry Medvedev's 28-year-old son. So they sanctioned him as well. Uh, the... The EU values at work. <laughs> Those EU values at work. Uh, anyway, let's see here. Let's wrap this video up. Reuters, they put out an article saying that if Trump were to be elected president, he would appoint loyalists, especially when it comes to foreign policy, who would influence his foreign policy on China, NATO, Ukraine, and stuff like that. How, how dare... How dare Trump, if he's president, how dare Trump appoint people to his cabinet that he likes? <laughs> you see what I mean? They're, they're going to try to they're going to try to fill fill Trump's head up with nonsense. His campaign, they're going to try to influence his campaign to uh, not appoint people who would actually be who would actually be uh, good for the job and who would look after. Uh, the, the president and America, if Trump were to be president. They're, they're already trying to steer Trump away from appointing people that he trusts and appointing neocons who he should not trust. So Reuters puts out this article saying that, uh, be aware, Trump is going to appoint loyalists, his friends, people that he admires, people that he feels will do a good job. How dare he do that? <laughs> when, when you're president... You should uh, appoint people that, that hate you, that despise you, <laughs> that want to remove you, that want to impeach you, like John Bolton. Those are the people that you should uh, put into your cabinet, right? Of course. That's what Biden did. <laughs> oh, boy, these guys. These guys. And finally, before I get to my clown world, we have the, the new story that... American uh, U.S. Steel, U.S. Steel, American steelmaking giant. U.S. Steel was sold to Japan's Nippon Steel for $14.9 billion. A takeover of $14.9 billion. Uh, what's Hyman Roth going to say now? <laughs> what would Hyman Roth say now? Michael. Michael, we're going to be bigger than U.S. Steel. Now that line in The Godfather 2 has to get amended. So when Hyman Roth is sitting on that sofa and he's, 
He's speaking with uh, Michael. He's going to have to say, Michael, we're going to be bigger than Nippon Steel. <laughs> Yeah, they're going to have to go back and, and digitally alter that scene with Hyman Roth and Michael Corleone. All right, let's do, uh, let's do a clown world and we'll wrap this video up. From German media, German customs warns. Christmas presents from Russia will be confiscated. Whether books, toys, or cosmetics, Christmas packages from Russia are largely banned and could be confiscated, warns German customs. Wow. The Grinch that stole Christmas. <laughs> Olaf Schultz. The Olaf Schultz that stole Christmas. <laughs> Actually, when, when you look at the Grinch and when you look at Olaf Schultz, they're kind of, they kind of uh, look alike, don't they? <laughs> Olaf Schultz does look like the Grinch, doesn't he? The Olaf that stole Christmas. <laughs> oh, boy. You have to be a very special kind of evil, don't you, to, to not allow Christmas presents to enter your country. I mean, that's like a special type of evil, <laughs> man. Anyway, that's the video, everybody. TheDuran.Locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, Rockfin, and Twitter X. And go to the Duran shop. 20% off. Use the code the Duran 20 And we are also running a Christmas uh, contest on our locals as well. So check that out. You get all kinds of discounts and free merch. The Duran.locals.com. And, and I don't say this often, but maybe, maybe you guys can, can give me a, a Christmas present and like this video. <laughs> Or not. You could be like Ola Schultz and dislike this video. <laughs> Don't be a Grinch. <laughs> but if you, if you want to be like Schultz and dislike this video, fine. All right. Anyway, that's the video, everybody. Take care.